Good morning, everyone. Forgive me for being maybe one minute, half a minute late. Would you stand with us? You know, the problem with reading scriptures off your phone is that if you bump it, you're in a different version, you're in the wrong verse. It's like all over the place. So forgive me, but I'm here and I've got a scripture that the Lord prompted me with last night. It's from 1 Chronicles 16. And at verse 23, it says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvellous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendour of His holiness. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. So let's praise Him this morning. Let's give Him thanks as we have been in this season. Let's give Him thanks for who He is and everything that He's done. Amen.
plan that you had since the beginning of creation to redeem us to yourself. You already knew how things would go and you already had a plan to bring us back to you in relationship with you. And so today we don't wanna talk about you like you're not in the room. We know that you're here, Lord. And we welcome your presence in this place. We know that you are good. And so we declare your goodness. Even if some of the things that we haven't experienced in this earth so far have been, haven't been so good, we know you are good and you're in the process of redeeming all things to yourself. So we bless you and we praise you and we thank you this morning, Lord, for your goodness.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness this morning. And we come and declare as one people that you are good, not in some ethereal sense. No, you've been good to us. We've seen your goodness in our lives. We've experienced it, Lord. That you knit us together in our mother's womb. You had plans for us before we were even born. You've always loved us, always worked for our good. You're faithful, even when we're not. And oh Lord, the truth is that we're often not faithful. But even when we're not faithful, you are ever present. You are faithful and you're good. And because of that, Jesus, you become the rock on which we stand. That which we place our trust and our hope in, not in our ability to get it right, in our goodness, but in you and in your goodness and your faithfulness displayed perfectly for us on the cross. As we lift up the name of Jesus in this place and we declare your goodness, your faithfulness, we worship you for who you are this morning. And this we pray in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. Before you take a seat this morning, why don't you welcome the people around you? You're not here alone. It's significant to be together. Fantastic. Well, somebody's laughing. I don't know if that's good or bad. We'll take it as good. We'll take it as good. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here this morning because there is something significant about coming together to worship. The corporate expression of our faith is incredibly important. So thank you for being here. We do it together, and actually that's a part of the richness is that we get to come and do it together. Kids, it's time for you to head off to MPK. You guys are looking at the Magi or the, or the wise men who brought gifts to Jesus. So may you be blessed as you unpack what it means to honor our King. It's a beautiful topic and we hope that you guys are blessed by it. For everyone else, stick around after the service. There's coffee available in the foyer, which is really just a great excuse for us to encourage and serve and get to know one another. The cafe is also open before the 8.30 service and in between our 8.30 and 10.30 services. And as a new addition, there's also a, a hangout era, area, I can't speak, a hangout area for our youth in the function room after the service. The one and only Janelle Palmer is bringing that together. So if you're in high school and you're not sure where to go or what to do after the service, head to the function room. You don't have to cling on to mum and dad you're not really interested in their conversation anyway, okay? So go to the function room. Maybe you can get to know some fellow high schoolers and maybe even make a friend. Wouldn't that be something? I think that'd be great. So high schoolers, hang out area for you in the function room. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd like any information about who we are as a church or where the Lord is taking us, then I'd encourage you to head to the Connect Point after the service. There's a beautiful group of people who'd love to help you in any way we can. Now, I've got a couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, you would have seen uh, the Baptist World Aid stand set up in the foyer on your way in this morning, and that's because Better World Gifts is launching today. Now, this used to be called Big Hearted Gifts. The name has changed, but the ministry, the initiative hasn't. So if you're passionate about ending poverty, go check out the stand after the service. It's the perfect gift for the person who has everything or for the person who isn't happy with anything. And if that's your spouse or you, I mean, let's have a bit of self-integrity, right? A bit of honesty about who we are. If that's you. Maybe you should go check out this cause. It's a great, great cause. The stand is in the foyer. You buy uh, a card for them, and it's essentially you're, you're sponsoring a fantastic cause on their behalf, and then they get a beautiful card to symbolize that. So go check that out in the stand in the foyer after the service. College has an event coming up as well. It's called Origin, Thursday the 30th of November. So that's next Thursday at 6 p.m. It's an opportunity for our Cert for students in screen and media to show off their work, but also alongside them, the Cert for students in design, which means it's also then an opportunity for 
for us to support our college and to bless our students by coming along and being curious and getting to know them and getting to know their work. So that's an opportunity for us. Speaking of blessing our young people, youth camp registrations close today. So if you haven't signed up for camp yet, firstly, what's wrong with you? Secondly, get organised and get signed up. We've mapped out the weekend with our leaders. They're busy planning all the activity. We locked in all of our sessions with our speaker during the week. So we're ready to go and we just need the kids. So get organized and get signed up. On Friday, I told our kids, if they haven't signed up for camp, to harass, harass their parents, to wake them up at ungodly hours and say, please, I love Jesus, send me to camp, please. So so just sign them up for camp, all right? That's all you have to do. And then you can save yourself from pain. Fantastic. All right, that's all the announcements that I have for you today. But we've got a couple of our gospel partners sharing with us today. We're going to hear from Keith Gallagher in just a moment. But first, we're going to get an update from Alistair Smith. Now, most of you would probably know Alistair. He's, he's one of us, which is really awesome. He's been serving the Lord in Japan for the last year, which has uh, been incredibly exciting for us to see one of our young adults step out in faith and go serve the Lord overseas. I think it's fair to say that it hasn't all gone to plan. He's faced a number of challenges, and yet in the midst of all of that, he's just there faithfully plugging away, faithfully serving the Lord. So we're going to hear an update from him now. Good morning, everyone. My name's Alistair, and thank you very much to Mounties for having me as the theme for November's Missional Links. What you're about to see is footage taken from a typical morning at Cafe Cohen on Saturday. Cafe Cohen is an area of ministry that I've been working in for the past 10 months in Sapporo, Japan. Cafe Cohen combines not only cafe ministry, but also English teaching ministry as well to the people in the neighborhood of Oyachi. For the past year, I've been incredibly proud to be here, but also incredibly proud to serve the people of Oyachi. And it's been amazing to see more people come to know Jesus and to see the people come to know a little bit more about Jesus than they used to as a result of learning English here and spending time at the cafe. Unfortunately, due to a variety of factors, Cafe Cohen is forced to close down and will be shutting on the 2nd of December. This is something that's very sad for us and something that the owners, Dale and Karen, are very reluctant to do, but unfortunately they have been forced into this situation. There are many reasons for this. But the biggest reason is that our beloved sister and friend of mine, Hiromi Takahashi, passed away tragically in a bus accident in June of this year. She had been serving at Cafe Cohen for 16 years, she was irreplaceable, and she was such an influential Christian in this part of Japan that her death made the local news and the outpouring of support from the community was absolutely tremendous. This is unprecedented for a Christian in Japan to receive this much media attention and grieving upon her death. She was recognized as a very positive force in this community due to her faithful, lifelong service of Jesus. I was really proud to know her and very happy to have met her, but due to several factors such as her passing and staff shortages and money shortages and Dale and Karen aging, we are forced to close down. However, that doesn't mean that you can't pray for us. In fact, there's a few things that I would like to ask that you pray for today. Firstly, I would like to ask that you pray for some sort of successor to Cafe Cohen. We've been looking for new full-time owners for the past six months, but nobody has put their hand up to be the new owners. Some people are considering being the owners if the cafe was moved to a new location or if there were more available staff. However, there are no concrete plans for new owners yet. Please pray that there would be someone who is willing to take the reins of the cafe and become the new owners. This is an amazing place where many people come to meet with Christians, often for the first time in their lives, and it would be a real shame for this place to close down permanently. I would ask that you pray, please pray for a, a pastor or a Christian English teacher or somebody of that nature to volunteer and help keep this place going. I also ask that you pray for the students and customers of Cafe Cohen. Please pray that they would continue to spend time with one another Pray that even despite the cafe's closure, that they would want to hear about Jesus and what Jesus means to us. Pray that they would turn to Jesus in times of discomfort and times of pain. I pray personally that this would not be a time of loss for them, but instead a time of transition into something new and better for them. 
Many people come here because they're very stressed out from work, or they're lonely, and or they're retired, or they don't feel comfortable being in most normal situations. So they come to Cafe Cohen as a refuge from these aspects of their lives. The last thing I ask that you pray for is the continuation of the Cohen Bible community and church. We have a community of about eight members who regularly come to church, and we will have no permanent venue for the church in the meantime. So I ask that you pray the community remains resilient and faithful to the Lord. Anyway, that's all for me today. I've asked for a lot of prayer, even though my mission is certainly experiencing a seasonal winter, and I want to thank you for your prayers, and hopefully, despite all the negativity, I hope that God's mission would be put on your minds and that you would respond to God's calling, however that might look like for you. Have a lovely Sunday, Mounties family. Lots to be praying for in that space. Hasn't been easy for Alistair this year. Uh, we know the Lord is in the midst of all of that. So we need to be praying for him and we need to be praying for the cafe ministry. It's a part of what it means to support our gospel partners. We don't just give money. No, we're there with them and we're there to encourage, but we're also there to pray for them. So we need to be doing that. Speaking of our gospel partners, Keith, I was going to invite you up, but you're already here. You snuck up. Silent, like a ninja. He's here. Over to you. Snuck up. It was pretty obvious. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. First of all, thank you for your support in the ministry that I am and have been involved in. My context is within the Baptist Mission of Australia, work in Zambia and Zimbabwe. If your geography isn't much good, these two countries sit on the top of the Republic of South Africa. First, it was to rural Zambia. Adamson Shamfuti is working to rebuild the work of the Fawali Hill Bible College following the devastating stroke of the previous principal. My first two and a half weeks were spent teaching through the book of Acts and marking the major assignment. It's hardly exciting, but it remains important for people who are going into the full-time ministry to prepare themselves. These students will become leaders in the future. The formal work was complemented by preaching in the rural churches on Sundays. That's the boring bit, the whole Bible college thing. I read in God's word, the book of John, that God is spirit, and I ask just myself, how does a spirit contact us in the physical world? And I realise his greatest connection was when he became a human being in Jesus. And I realise that we are involved in his work as people contacting and connecting with people. As God did, as Jesus did, and I'm sure that the Spirit does today. Moving along to my second role, and that was providing encouragement and pastoral support for people, a variety of people. Costa and Calusa serves in the rural area of Valenji, and uh, from whom I had news just last week that his wife had died. Support for him. And there is also Redson Chisenga. An advantage of being old, and there are only a very few advantages, is that old people understand that. There, one, of the, uh, one of the advantages is that we have been a part of God's unfolding work and history. We have seen it. Regid, Redson Chisenga was in his late teens when I met him in the early 1970s. He travelled with us as we started new rural, new rural churches, We've gone way past it now. Uh, as a teenager, he did everything such as smashing up a cow's head to cook and eat. At 21 years of age, he was given the responsibility of being left in a church, in a village, a single young guy to assist in its development. He was untrained, he was unpaid, and we dumped him there. It was probably irresponsible. He married Beauty, actually he's a fairly attractive young lady, and uh, from his local church. 
and in their early 20s they attended the Fuwalihu Bible College. Upon graduating, they moved into full-time pastoral work in different parts of the country. The years rolled along and they had four sons. God called them back to the town of Kapiri and Poshi in central Zambia, where today he pastors a new church. He has oversight of the non-residential training program and is leading the building and development of a skills training center. Beauty and Redson now have seven grandchildren. In my 50 year journey with Beauty and Redson, I have seen and been a part of the history of the spread and growth of God's people. Today I continue walking alongside Redson. It's seeing being and part of God's unfolding church through individual people like Beauty and Redson that we serve. The third sector of my uh, time was going to Zimbabwe and specifically to Rangemore Church outside of Bulawayo. Nimrod Kasande. Eight years ago, I met with a group of young people and there in the group was a small, unassuming teenager. He never took centre stage and over the coming years, I asked myself if he was even a committed follower of Jesus. Or was he just a hanger-on? He never seemed to come to the front, but he was always there. The family, like many in Zimbabwe, ran into financial stress and he couldn't finish schools, but it seems he struggled along at home. He was part of the group that I met with regularly over the last eight years. Last year at a session in a different church, we saw him speaking. On this visit, when I was in uh, Nimrod's home church, I called into the young people's training program meeting and there leading the group was Nimrod. Eight years later, a boy had become a man. He was now leading the group in the church. In the coming 30 plus years, will he be another Red St. Chisenga? You know, we oldies have seen and been a part of God's history. We need to remember that. The challenge for young people and young adults is that they have the great opportunity of being in making, the great opportunity of making the future history, the growth of God's people and God's church. And they will do that by walking alongside people like Redson, Beauty and Nimrod. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, church, why don't we pray? Lots to pray about in there. Oh, you go. Oh. Hmm? You want to pray as well? No, oh. I want to pray. I want you to pray. Oh, good. Well, I was going to pray. I am paid to pray. That's true. Well, you wanted to be a PE on the pr- I understand. All right. He, he has to do it for free is what he said. Fair enough. Well, you can all pay for free as well. Pay for free? Pray for free. All right, let's pray. We thank you, Jesus. First and foremost, we thank you that you are the king and that you build your kingdom all over the world. And we see pockets of that in Japan and we see pockets of that in Zambia. We see people faithfully stepping out. There's an element of risk within that. Sometimes not a lot of training, but feeling called by you. And so bravely, full of faith, stepping out trusting that actually you've got this and how grateful we are then to know Jesus that you do have this that you build your church that it's yours and the promise you give us in scriptures that the gates of hell cannot stand against it and so we thank you Jesus for people like Keith and people like Alistair who go and support and want to fan into flame things that we're seeing sprout overseas which is beautiful we we, we want to see people from every tribe and tongue come to know you, Jesus. We know the whole reason you haven't come back is because actually your heart is to see 
as many as possible come to find life in your name. And so we lift up these ministries before you. We pray, Father, for wisdom, for Keith and for Alistair to know how to support, how to encourage, how to build up. But we pray for people on the ground as well, our brothers and sisters, often with not the same resourcing or the same training, and yet the heart is just beautiful and you've chosen them and you're using them for your glory. And so we thank you for them and we pray, Father, that you would continue to build your church all around the world. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the opportunity to actually support not just financially, but actually through our prayers as well. Maybe even a letter of encouragement for our partners on the ground. The opportunity for us to be a part of your real business, not just here in Perth, but actually all around the world. It's a privilege, it's an honour. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, more than anything we pray, because we know that ultimately it is you, we pray, Jesus, that you would come in power and that you would build your church and that you would grace um, be people by using them for your glory. And this we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. All right, church, we're going to take uh, in just a moment, it's going to be an opportunity for us to give together. And then Keystone is going to head out. But before we do that, why don't we bring um, our offering before the Lord and why don't we pray? It's an act of worship from us to the King. So let's pray over that together. Lord Jesus, there's much to be thankful for in and around this place, but there's also much to pray for. We think of the ceasefire in Palestine, how grateful we are for that. And Lord, our prayer really simple is that it would continue, that this ceasefire would hold. We think in particular, Father, for the innocent victims who get swept up in conflict on both sides. And there's so much collateral damage. We know it would just break your heart. And so we're just praying more than anything, for the region of Palestine, we're praying for peace. Father, for a breakthrough, for the shalom of God to come, and for you to make a way where sometimes there seems to be no way. Our world is full of conflict, full of war. And Father, it's just a part of the brokenness, the sinfulness of man, and how much we need you, Jesus, how much we need you to continue to bring your kingdom, to continue to build your church, that you might rule and reign, and you might bring peace. And so we pray for that in the name of Jesus. Continue to pray for Honeywood and for Thornley, a local expression of mission here on the ground. We support our gospel partners overseas, and we pray that you would bless them. But then, Father, we also pray for our local campuses as they reach out into the wider city of Perth, and we pray for them as well. For Michael, and for Craig, and for Harry, we pray that you would bless them and give them wisdom. We need each and every person who stepped out to be part of the planting team at Honeywood in particular. Father, we pray that you would bless them. Give them wisdom to know how it is actually that you want to use them in those circumstances, in those local cities. And we pray, Father, that you just open doors for the gospel. We know that when we try to bash down doors, we often do damage. And yet when we get on board with what you're already doing, because you've opened the door and you've gone before us and you're at work in people's hearts, and so we just join you there, we know that actually it can be beautiful and easy. And so we pray for that. We pray for the wisdom to know where you are at work and then the courage to join you there. Yeah. We pray for our offering as well, Lord Jesus. We give this morning because we have a passion to see injustice made right. Because there are people in need and we have the ability to actually meet that need. And so what a privilege it is to actually give this morning. But we also give as an act of worship and love to you, our God and King, because we want to say, even in our finances, Jesus, you are first. Nothing stands above you. You're first. And so out of the first fruits, we give back to you this morning. Because we recognize all that we have, all that we are, is a gift from you. And so we give this morning as an act of worship. We pray that you would use it for your glory and for your kingdom to bless the people around us and the people overseas. Support our gospel partners to see the kingdom come. This we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You'll notice the green buckets on the end of the aisle. You can pass those along as we give together this morning. If you're a visitor here this morning, please don't feel any pressure to give. This is for people who call Mount Pleasant Baptist home. And for our high schoolers this morning, it's time for you guys to head out to Keystone. And in Acts chapter 4, may you be blessed this morning.
for everybody else, let's stand as we continue to worship. some words of Jesus in Luke 17 that have been laid on my heart lately and in relation to this song. And Jesus said, in the New Living Translation, it's translated, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you let go of your life, you will save it. And Lord, we want to go deeper in you. We want to experience more of your presence, Lord more of your kingdom. <laughs> Would your kingdom come in our lives, Lord? But we need to make space for that. <laughs> I believe that's what you've been telling me. We need to make space so you can come fill it. So Lord, we want to lay down control of stuff, people, circumstances, our lives generally. We yield to you, surrender more deeply to you. clinging to our lives. <laughs> we want to give them to you and invite you to come fill it with your salvation. Fill our lives with your presence, with manifestations of your kingdom.
Jason's time to linger in his presence. I sense the Lord saying to me, well, I believe he said to me that um, if we make space, that he will come. So we want to draw close to you, Lord. And draw near to you and allow you to draw near to us. So just let's linger in, in his presence for a while. Come, Holy Spirit.
Praise to the Lord, praise to the Lamb, the King of Heaven. Lord, you alone deserve the honour and the glory and the praise. So we bow before you this morning, Lord, in this place. We would seek to give you space, space to speak to us, space to work in our lives, space to adjust our busy programs that we might align ourselves with you and with your spirit, with your will for our lives. Oh Lord, speak to us this morning through your word, through this passage. We ask that you be with us, that you guide us, and that you keep us attentive, Lord, this morning to the promptings of your spirit. We ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please be seated. Thanks to the team. Good morning. morning. Welcome. Lovely to have you here with us in person and uh, online. Those of us who are joining online, great to have you here with us as well as we come this morning to our uh, our final message in the series on being thankful. And uh, this morning we're going to focus in on a passage in Hebrews that uh, encourages us to be eternally thankful. That's our theme for this morning. At a recent... uh, visit to her GP, my wife, Margie, made a comment to her doctor, and uh, this is what she said. She said, you know, um, I'm going to be turning 60 next year, so uh, I guess I'm just getting old. What she anticipated was her doctor saying something like, no, no, 60's not old, you're a spring chicken, years of life ahead of you. But uh, her doctor didn't say that. Instead, her doctor uh, agreed with her. (laughs) Time for a new doctor. Her doctor said, yeah, well, yeah, you are getting old. (laughs) She's thinking, that's not what you're supposed to say. (laughs) Well, we're all getting older, day by day. And I was speaking to my parents in Adelaide 
a week or so ago, and uh, they're well into their 80s. I've got a picture of them, I think, to just flash up there. You might have seen that before. And, uh, you know, they're in their mid to late 80s, doing very well, actually, for the most part. But, uh, but my dad <laughs> said to me the other day, he said, you know, Nick, um, people around us keep falling off the perch. <laughs> That's what happens when you get older. And uh, he, said, uh, <laughs> he said, we're wondering uh, if we might be next. <laughs> he said it with a smile on his face. But uh, I reckon there was just a sense of uh, just quiet concern behind the comment. You know, when your uh, peers are dying, it can seem a bit grim. And the world's a bit grim, isn't it, at the moment? All this talk of climate change and, uh, you know, things are heating up. Things are heating up in other ways as well. The crisis in the Middle East as the world watches on with concern and China and the US and Russia kind of gather. And we think, wow... Where's all this going? Closer to home, things are heating up with the cost of living pressures, interest rates rising, crime rates on the increase, pressure with an exponential acceleration of technological advancement has also come an exponential acceleration of anxiety and mental health issues as people struggle to cope with the pressures of everyday life. And uh, the pressures are real. The struggle is real. I uh, recently attended a, 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 an event put on by CPX, the Centre for Public Christianity. It was a, a lecture in the city on the topic of hope. And one point that was made was that in our society, for our younger generation, I found this interesting, there's a difference in perspective from the younger generation to the older generation. For our younger generation, there's a distinct lack of hope compared to the older generation. So in the, in the minds of our children, the landscape is already pretty grim. And the greatest hope they have, our children in this sort of a series of options they were given to choose from, the greatest hope they have is that things won't get worse than they are. Isn't that telling? And so very often in the minds of our children, there's a, there's a deep sense of anxiety actually about the future of our world, about their future, and that anxiety is fueled by the information that they are fed relentlessly often and the picture that's being painted for them. And it's a very grim picture. The future is bleak. There's not much hope. The world's going to pot. Bet you're glad you came this morning, aren't you? <laughs> so that's the end of my message. So let's just close. <laughs> you know... Uh, it's only grim. The picture is only grim if you take a purely earthly perspective. If this world and this life is all there is, then yes, it's grim and we should probably be very anxious. But as followers of Jesus, we are called to take not an earthly perspective that's temporal, but a heavenly perspective that is eternal. And that changes everything. The Christian narrative has a wonderful ending that is full of hope and life. A narrative that we need to feed into the minds of our children and our grandchildren, our younger generation. So when we encounter the death of a loved one, for example, we grieve, of course, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope, say the Scriptures. In our grief, we celebrate something greater that is to come. When we consider climate change, yes, we should be concerned and uh, we should be the best stewards of God's creation that we can, but we don't approach that topic with fear that so often is the driving force behind that narrative. Fear that leads to anxiety. We don't do that because we have hope that the creation that currently groans, right? Romans 8 in anticipation, currently groans, will one day be renewed by the sovereign God. Yes. When we think of the war in Israel, as followers of Jesus, we should pray for Israel. Absolutely, yes. We should pray for Palestine as well. By the way, both nations have rejected Christ as Messiah, both nations need a saviour as does our own nature, which also has 
largely rejected Jesus. So we pray. But we pray to the one who sits on the throne as the nations rage and who will one day return to restore order to his world. And so we have hope as a people. We have eternal hope. And so as we reorientate our thinking to that mindset, the result is a thankfulness that disperses anxiety and dispenses with fear. Now to our passage this morning, which speaks to these things well. It's Hebrews 12 and verses 18 to 29. Let me read these for you. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What is that all about? You know, it's one of those passages, isn't it, that at first glance you might uh, just skip over it because it all seems a bit difficult to understand. We, uh, we want to jump quickly to chapter 13 that starts, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Uh, we can get our heads around that. Also, let's talk about mountains. But here we have a tale of two mountains to misquote Dickens. And uh, the two mountains, let me just explain a bit of this to you. It seems a bit weird, doesn't it? But um, the two mountains represent the two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. And the sharp, distinct contrast between the two. So the first mountain, I've got a couple of images for you. The first mountain is a mountain of fear and refers back to the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And uh, if you remember that story back in Exodus chapter 19, you can sort of have a quick flick through that right now or at some other time if you like, you'll recall that the people's approach to God at Sinai was an experience of overwhelming fear as they stood at the base of the mountain some distance away, they trembled with fear. Moses himself trembled with fear. And at the top of the mountain, there was uh, the presence of the living God. There was blazing fire, thick black clouds, deep darkness, billowing smoke. There were all these terrifying trumpet blasts that were getting louder and louder. The whole mountain shook with the presence of God. The people were terrified, understandably so, rightly so. They should have been terrified. The impression they had of God was that he was highly impersonal, um, communicating this clear message. And the message was this, stay away. Don't come any closer to this mountain. Don't come any closer to the presence of God. You'll be consumed. For God is a consuming fire. Which actually was a quote from Moses from Deuteronomy chapter 4. 
So here we have it, Mount Sinai, a mountain of fear, a mountain of the old covenant. This is the mountain that's described here in Hebrews chapter 12. Well, then in this passage, the writer draws this extraordinarily stark contrast between that mountain and a vastly different mountain, a mountain not from the past, but from the future. A mountain not of the old covenant, but of the new covenant, the mountain of the heavenly city of Zion, Mount Zion. And this is a mountain not of fear, but a mountain of great joy. And here, in the picture, people's approach to God is characterized not by fear, but by unspeakable joy and, in fact, jubilation. You've got this description of thousands upon thousands of angels in, uh, in joyful assembly. And uh, the word used here for joyful assembly is uh, the only use of this word in the New Testament. But in secular literature, it was used to describe the great crowds, the great gathering, the great celebratory atmosphere of, uh, of the Olympic Games in ancient times. So think of the, um, the recent intense jubilation of the Indian cricket crowd when they thought they were winning <laughs> the World Cup. That was short-lived. Uh, apologies to our Indian brothers and sisters here this morning. Not really an apology. But if you saw any of that, uh, that game, that great world event, 130,000 Indians essentially crammed into this massive stadium there in India in ecstatic jubilation. And there were times it would pan across the crowd, the camera, and it was a remarkable sight. Uh, drums, colour, dancing, singing, you know, like they were just all so, so excited. That's the picture, that's the Mount Zion picture, actually. Excitement, celebration, overall well-being. It's a beautiful picture, actually. These are people of every nation, tribe and tongue who belong to the church of the firstborn, who is Jesus in this passage, people whose names are written in heaven. Now there is a joyful concept. Their names are written in heaven. And you might remember the story in Luke chapter 10 of the 72 who'd been sent out by Jesus and then when they came back from their assignment, uh, they came returning to Jesus with a great sense of joy saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. How cool is that? Like, they're really, really excited about that. And uh, Jesus essentially says, hey, uh, I'll give you something to rejoice about. Don't just rejoice in that. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Think about that for a moment. You know, every time we sing that old hymn before the throne of God above, I'm deeply moved by that line just somehow gets to me every time the line says, my name is graven on his hands. My name is written in his heart. The God of all things, the God of creation, the God of eternity, knows my name. He knows your name. He knows your name. My name is written in heaven. I wonder as you sit here this morning whether you have that confidence that you know, that you know, that you know that your name is written in heaven. Something for which you can be eternally thankful. What a contrast between the mountain of fear and the mountain of joy, one with the message of stay away, don't, don't come any closer, you'll, just, you'll be consumed. The other with the message of warm invitation, come. You're invited, you're included, come. You belong, come and be with me. And the difference between the old mountain and the new mountain, 
the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, quite simply, is Jesus. He is the difference. What a difference Jesus makes. Before Jesus came, God seemed distant and threatening. After Jesus came, Godly, God warmly welcomes us through Christ into his presence. And so in this passage, there are these two mountains, the mountain of fear, the mountain of joy. And then there's a stern warning. Verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. It's a stern warning. A couple of chapters earlier we read, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, what we need to understand is that the God of Sinai is also the God of Zion. Not two gods. Yeah, some people say, oh, I don't like the Old Testament God. I love the New Testament. It's the same God. Yes. There is one God. He's a God to be feared, not a God to be trifled with. He's a God who, through Christ, invites you to be part of a jubilant, joyful celebration for all eternity. But such is the grace of God that he won't force you to accept that invitation. See, the grace of God is a wonderful thing, but it needs to be rightly understood. Because grace does not say to humanity, whatever you have done, come, and oh yes, everything will really be okay even if you don't come. It'll all be okay. Grace does not say that. Or come, and if you, if you act as though you've come, you're not really coming, but you're just kind of playing some little church attendance thing to try and have a foot in both camps. It'll all, be, it'll all be okay. Grace does not say that. You know, I've, um, I've attended many funerals over the years for people who during their life on earth have clearly not responded to God's invitation to come. People who have rejected God and his ways, people who we might say have refused him who speaks. They've not accepted the invitation. But then in death, the message at the funeral so often is, oh, yes, but he's lived, he's lived a good life. He was a, he was a good man. He was a good guy, deep down. So therefore, he has gone to a better place. Well, based on what? Is what I think. What are you basing that on? It's wishful thinking. It's not the teaching of the scripture. It's not the word of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to base my life, my eternity on wishful thinking. See, grace, it's a wonderful thing. Grace must be received and enjoyed and understood in the context of covenant, a covenant relationship. Those who refuse him who speaks, those who reject the new covenant, reject grace, and therefore, consequently, embrace judgment. By default, they embrace judgment. They don't accept the grace. They don't accept the, 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 the invitation, the warm invitation that's extended to them. And so we should heed the warning. And we should accept the invitation. And then the final word in the passage is a, a call to eternal thankfulness. It says this, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, amen, let us be thankful. Let us be eternally thankful. And so, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, which is the right response to God. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. The consuming fire on the Mount Sinai continues to be the consuming fire of God. Just this week, we've seen some frightening scenes of bushfires raging here in Perth, uh, north and south. Um, 
consuming everything in their path. Goodness, it's a, it's, it's a frightening sight, isn't it? Now and then you'll hear firefighters say things like, you know, we're currently unable to contain this fire. It's too powerful. Well, this is the nature of the consuming fire of God. It cannot be contained. It's a fire that is not within our control. It's not out of control, by the way. The consuming of fire of God is never out of control. It's in his control. But it cannot be contained. But here's a perspective you may not have thought about before. The consuming fire of God is a wonderful thing. Everything that is worthless, everything that is evil, everything that is sinful or corrupt or shameful will ultimately be consumed by the refining fire of God's wrath. How great is that? I don't know about you, but you know, for me, there are things from my past, things that I regret. There are things that I'm ashamed of. There are things I can just call to mind right now that cause me to feel embarrassment and shame and guilt. Now I know that I'm forgiven for those things. Those things have been dealt with by Jesus at the cross. Hallelujah. A thousand hallelujahs. I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. I know it. But those things, you know, those things, they remain in my memory, in my conscience. And the accuser will take every opportunity to remind me of those things and try and convince me, actually, of my unworthiness. I mean, goodness, how dare I stand in front of a group like this and talk about the grace of God with what I've done. But the day will come when the consuming fire of the wrath of God will forever burn up all those things in my life and your life, in my history, in your history, until all that remains is the perfect image of Christ in you, preserved for all eternity. The rest of it is gone, destroyed by fire. For these things, I am eternally thankful. I'm so thankful to God. But these things are only available to those who accept the invitation to come to God in faith and to enter into an eternal covenant with him. We live in grim times. And the future looks pretty bleak from an earthly perspective. But you know, God invites us into an eternal covenant, an eternal relationship with him, and therefore to take on a heavenly perspective. You know, that changes everything. It changes everything. The last few verses of the Bible include these pleading final words from God in Revelation 22. The spirit and the bride say, come, come. Let the one who hears Say, come, let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. It's a wonderful, wonderful, open invitation. It's a free gift, costly for the giver, but free for all who would come and receive see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks the one who offers you eternal life let's bow in prayer shall we Father, these are uh, sobering thoughts for us this morning as we together contemplate 
these words of scripture that describe a mountain of fear and a mountain of joy and a stern warning, but a warm invitation to respond to you as the God of Mount Zion. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Eternal God, you are the, you're the Alpha, the Omega. You never change. But Lord, in Jesus and through the cross, we discover this remarkable invitation to grace. So this morning, even this morning, just in these quiet moments, we just lay our lives before you. We confess to you our apathy at times, our half-hearted commitment to you. But Lord, draw us to yourself and give us hearts that are on fire for you. Give us a perspective that's a heavenly perspective, not an earthly perspective. An eternal perspective that we might be those who view the world through a different lens, the lens of eternity. And therefore we come this morning as those who are eternally thankful. Eternally thankful, not fearful, but joyful for all that you've done for us, but all, for all that is to come as we look to you, the King of Zion. Oh Lord, we eagerly respond to your invitation. We eagerly anticipate those scenes of jubilation, celebration, when we will all be together as those whose names are written in heaven. Our names graven on your hands, written in your heart. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us now as we sing with them?
I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at this love divine. God's perfect Son was sacrificed to make me righteous in God's eyes. This That'll be me then. <laughs> That's unexpected. Now I don't know what to say. Well, I'll just, we'll just close our time together. But um, next week, yeah. <laughs> yeah, next week. Dan's gone to prepare, actually, just uh, <laughs> for next week. He's just realised he's preaching. So uh, we, it's the, the series, actually, we're starting a new series. It's called Waiting Well. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of... Um, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, good. Oh, good. Thanks. Yeah. Useful. Uh, wait. A lot of life is spent waiting, isn't it? You know, um, and that can be a source of great frustration. But there's there's such a thing as waiting. Well, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And so, uh, as we wait for Christmas, as we anticipate the coming of Jesus at Christmas, uh, this is going to be what we're looking at. Just some examples of um, characters in the Scripture who had to wait and uh, what that was like for them. So weeping, come prepared to weep next week. And uh, we look forward to that. The church family meeting also is next week. There'll be much weeping and gnashing of teeth. No, not at all. No, that'll be a time of great joy. It's more like Zion than the other one. Uh, that's next Sunday, 12 to 1. You're welcome to that. Even if you're not a member, you're welcome to come along and just hear some things about uh, uh, where our church is at and where we're going. And uh, then also there is a Seeds 10% off sale from the 3rd to the 17th of December. Well, I hope it hasn't been too heavy for you this morning. It's actually, it, I didn't mean it to be heavy, just felt a bit heavy at times there for a while. But um, it's weighty, there's some weighty things in there. But, uh, but God is good, God is gracious. And uh, this morning, if um, something significant's happened for you, just encourage you to just mention it to the person next to you. Maybe you can just pray for someone near you. Or if you'd like to come to the front here, I'd love to pray with you as well. Dan probably won't pray with you. He's, he's nowhere to be found. But uh, <laughs> God bless you. Let's come and, uh, come and have a cup of coffee together. See you next week. <laughs>